60s were a kind of scary time for Hollywood. The forces that had ruled Hollywood, that had made Hollywood so successful during the 30s, 40s, 50s, and even into the 60s, were ending. The original moguls that built the industry, the Jack Warners, the Xanax, the, you know, all these early pioneers were leaving the studios, and the studios were being sold to large corporations. Production was very, very sparse as far as spending money to make films, and people were looking to get out of it, not get into it. City at night. City at night. Whoa, whoa. Francis and George Lucas and I and a number of others had all run away from Los Angeles. Partly because we were all film, ex-film students, and to be a film student at that time was to have the little mark of Cain on your forehead, that uh, you were not welcome. And we decided that San Francisco would be a great place to start a little film company, and that we would outfit it with young, adventurous directors, and we would do alternative kinds of films. There was an idea that we could do something different than what was being done in Hollywood. Back then, it was very hard to get into the business. The business itself was, uh, some people believed that it was the end of movies as we knew it. There had been some big failures of, of films that had traditionally been very successful, like, you know, The Sound of, the, of Music was one of the, thought to be the biggest, most successful film uh, made at the time. And then they made another film with the same team called Star, and, it, and no one came to see it. It was a period of extraordinary change. I've never seen public taste change as quickly. In fact, 1969 or 1970 was the year of lowest movie attendance ever. David Niven uh, has written, we would look back in the future, we would look back on going to the movies the way we look back now on vaudeville. But it was a peculiar uh, social situation that happened uh, for a 50 or 60 year period, and then it died out because of television. In the 30s, 40s, and 50s, Paramount was one of the great legendary studios, great stars. But by the time you get to the 1960s, it really was the bottom of the top eight. Would you believe that Paramount was bought, oh, five years before The Godfather was made, the entire studio was bought for $600,000. Charlie Blue Durham was the head of Gulf Western which was a giant conglomerate who had bought Paramount. He was a very dynamic entrepreneur, you know, buying and selling companies and countries and God knows what all. The Mel Brooks film, Silent Movie, was all about what was going on in Hollywood at the time, because it's about an old time Hollywood studio that was bought out by a conglomerate called Engulf and Devour, which is clearly a reference to Gulf and Western. And Gulf and Devour were these scary guys in a boardroom in New York City who were heartless and not interested in any kind of creativity and not really even interested in movies. In fact, they were thinking of just selling off the real estate just to turn a profit. Charlie told me they're going to close the studio down. I said, give me a chance to go and make a presentation to the board. Good afternoon. My name is Robert Evans, and I'm senior vice president of Paramount Pictures. My job at Paramount is to oversee our productions around the world. These uh, past few years have been rough for Hollywood. We've made a lot of mistakes. Paramount needed a hit, obviously, and, and they got a hit, by the way, in Love Story. Love Story was a very important film for Paramount. It's the first time in motion picture history that a picture is being released while the book is still the number one book in the nation. I think Love Story is going to bring the people back into the theater in droves. I could go on for an hour and tell you about 20 or 30 projects that are in various stages of development and bore you with it. So I won't. But I want to bring up one project, and that's The Godfather. To bring up the similarity between The Godfather and Love Story, which are the two biggest books of the last decade, we developed both of these books, spurring the writers on to make these books what we think will be the great movies they're going to be. Well, the book came out and it made its own history, but distribution at Paramount did not want to make it. In your wildest imagination, could you ever fathom 
developing a 30-page treatment into the biggest novel of the decade, and the distribution mavens don't want to make it. The city and mobster films don't play. That's what these distribution guys had to say. Look at The Brotherhood, a perfect example. Kirk Douglas, an all-star cast, terrific reviews. It didn't even have a first week in business. <laughs> Outside of Red Ink, every one of the films had another thing in common. They were written, directed, and produced, and usually starred Jews, not Sicilians. See, police! He's a tank at his club, and he's a play with it just to like a cop. I know. And it made matters worse. One director after another turned it down. Here I sit controlling the biggest book in the world, yet my company won't make it, and I can't find a fucking maestro to direct it. Richard Brooks, Costa Gravas, Elia Kazan, Arthur Penn, they all turned it down. A lot of directors said, interesting book, a little trashy, and it glamorizes the mafia. Bad subject. Francis happened to have been really new in the business. He only made three films, but he was Italian. And he didn't even want to make the picture. You know, I was hoping it was going to be some sort of intellectual film about power and succession. And in fact, it was a more sort of pseudo Hollywood Frank Sinatra stories and the woman with the needed an operation of her private parts and, and stuff that I thought was sleazy. Zotrope Studios in San Francisco was in a terrible financial crisis at the time. I remember discussions around the espresso machine about whether Francis should take the job or not, because it's exactly the kind of job, on one hand, that he was running away from. He wanted to make small, personal movies, European-type movies, and here was uh, Hollywood at, in a sense, it's Hollywoodiest uh, for the reasons that those other guys had turned it down, trying to grab him back. As things got sort of grimmer and grimmer on the American zoetrope front, I started encouraging Francis to think about our survival more than anything else. The time had come for us to get into lifeboats, and basically this godfather idea was a lifeboat. Remember George Lucas saying, just take the job, do it, do whatever they want, and just get the money, and then we can do what we want to do. And Francis was in agony over that. I thought I was going to read Yet, he had to admit that there was something compelling about it. After three long days of discussion with this guy, Peter comes into my office. Coppola will make the picture on one condition, that it's not a film about organized gangsters. It's not about organized gangsters. It ain't a musical, Peter. He has an idea, Heavens, that's not bad. He wants to make it as a family chronicle, a metaphor for capitalism in America. This is nuts, Peter. I don't like it. I just don't like it. Peter shook his head, laughed. Let's not forget, he's Italian. When I finally agreed to do it, it was because I began to become fascinated with it as a story of succession, the so-called story of a king with three sons. I don't know if I was able to verbalize so intelligently to someone, even to get back to Peter Bart, that I wanted to do it as a metaphor for capitalism. Ultimately, that's what it was. The story of Francis Coppola making The Godfather and all the obstacles he encountered and how it almost didn't happen, it's been told in articles, it's been recounted in books, but it's worth remembering. They hire a guy to direct the movie None of them had high expectations for the movie. They paid very little for the rights, very little to Mario Puzo for the screenplay, which he wrote with Francis. The trouble was that it became this huge international bestseller. Everybody in the company, the chairman, the president, all these people who never really intruded that much had a better idea for how to put it together. And they objected to almost every major character who was cast. They didn't want Brando, they didn't want Pacino, and Francis had a fight for all of these people. These were very difficult sells to Paramount. Who do you want to play the Godfather? I want Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando will never be in a film by Paramount. Francis wanted to cast Al Pacino, 
and the studio had Robert Redford in mind. In fact, if you read the book, Michael looks like Robert Redford. He doesn't look like an Italian person. He's blonde, he's tall, he's handsome. The idea that Francis would cast somebody small and dark and very Italian looking, in fact, an Italian, seemed to the studio to be completely mysterious. Paramount wanted to save money, and so one of the things they wanted to do was to not film it as a, a period piece in 1946, but instead to bring it up to the 1970s, make it contemporary, because that would be cheaper to you know, shoot in the contemporary style. Also, they wanted not to shoot in New York. They wanted to shoot it in St. Louis because it would be cheaper again. Francis ran headlong into that maelstrom, which was quite a bit worse than any of us could have imagined. It was just simply a conflict between them wanting to do a kind of low-budget pop boiler, get it out, uh, cash in on the popularity of the book, and Francis wanting to make something uh, meaningful about Italian Americans and the mafia and you know family. He had a kind of Jedi mind trick, I think, to convince the studio that what they absolutely did not want was, in fact, the best idea. And they went along with all of these, and eventually Francis um, was shooting the Godfather. powers that be at the studio as, as they were seeing the dailies were horrified, not only, they were horrified with everything. They didn't like Brando, they thought he mumbled, they thought it was much too dark, uh, I wasn't moving the camera. Francis had to fight every day to get his vision on the screen. It didn't come easy. I went and visited him on the set where he thrown the phones through the doors or fists through the door and phones across the room and they had the phones all lined up, they had the door sitting there, all of his outrage, and I knew that um, there were various people on the crew trying to take over the production. The man in charge of production didn't feel Coppola was competent. And it was true that someone was being warmed up in the wings to substitute for Francis. Francis could work under battle conditions or under conditions of, of peace. I suspect that his best work comes when he's under the gun. The scene where Michael kills Salazzo and McCluskey is a pivotal scene for all kinds of reasons. It was also the scene that when Francis was shooting the film, prevented Francis from actually being fired off the film. The feeling up to that point was, what is this movie? It's not turning out the way we thought it would, whatever that was. But when that scene Francis's cut of that scene was seen by the head of the corporation, then all the pressure that was on Francis disappeared. When the picture opened, the night it opened, to the Low State Theater in New York, Henry Kissinger said to me, said, you know, Bob, here's a man who's a killer, a gangster. He's killed hundreds of people. And yet when he dies, those people in the audience are all crying. That's touching greatness. And this bad couple has touched greatness. I came out on a Wednesday, I remember. I had just turned 15. And I told my father, who was out of work, I said, Dad, it's opening. And I, because I had been reading about it, I was a big movie fan, and all of us were big movie fans in the house. So we, we went on Saturday. We waited on line a long time. The lines were, were all the way around the block. And I remember it was just, I was just mesmerized. I believe in America. America has made my fortune. I think anyone who saw the movie uh, that day or that week knew that they saw something quite extraordinary. I, I was she dazzled by it. It's like, you know, Shakespeare. She kept her honor. So they beat her like an animal. I was pulverized by the story and by just the cumulative effect the film had on me. 
And um, I also felt that I should quit, that there was no reason to continue directing because I would never achieve that level of confidence and the ability to tell a story uh, such as the one I had just experienced. So in a way, it shattered my confidence. It, it was a, a celebration for people from my background. When we saw it, we were like, oh, wow, there we are. But then we're, are we that? We're not, we, you know, we're not that, you know? I think there's no doubt that Coppola being an Italian steeped in that culture, it's in every frame of that movie. The opening scene of Connie's wedding, the documentary footage of the mother, you know, or of them dancing and of them singing. I don't think that somebody who wasn't steeped in the culture could possibly have been that attentive to the kind of detail that it requires to set up the shots, to get it in a documentary style. A lot of these wide shots, you know, where you got so many people, so many things going on, and it's kind of extras, not quite, you know, there's, there's things about it that aren't perfect. I don't know whether it was intentional or not, but a lot of those things are just left in, but it makes it feel more real. I didn't grow up in a household that was movie savvy at all. People didn't watch films. My father's Italian and my mother's Jewish. It's, you know, and those two cultures are very similar. But everything, even like Sonny, when he gets upset and he's like biting his hand, you know what I mean? There's just like a... I mean, I've seen it with my, you know, male Italian relatives. It was the same gestures, it was the same, the family life was the same, it was the same uh, high level of, of tension and operatic behavior in the family. Probably not supposed to say this, but I had a problem because Marlon Brando was an Italian and James Kahn was an Italian. Maybe that's why James Kahn and Brando sort of stuck out for me, because the rest of it seemed, so I felt like I was seeing my family for the first time. Soon after that was Mean Streets, which was even more realistic. I don't think of them as gangster movies. I think of them as f Italian family movies because that's the level that I related to the film. It's got nothing to do with the occupation. It's got nothing to do with the good and evil aspects of what these people did for a living. But in terms of the family structure and the relationships and the food that they ate and the, the songs that they sang and the behavior that they had. <laughs> I don't think that you had the level of detail around family in, actually, in probably in any movie, but particularly in a gangster movie. It's a saga. Again, I think it's that the family aspect lends itself toward that, because that's the thing that everybody relates to. How's the baby? You know, that, that's what makes you care. Sleeping inside me. Does it feel like a boy? Yes. Yes, it does, Michael. It's family drama at its best. Scenes of, like, the big parties and the dysfunction where somebody's too drunk and, like, saying something that they shouldn't, um, the fights that break out or, you know, that kind of thing. The culture made sense to me. You see? I mean, when you got a scene where you've got, uh, you know, Clemenza put, you know, stirring the meat, saying how you have to fry the meat first in the bottom of the pot before you put in the tomatoes and this and that. This is the kind of stuff I've been hearing in the kitchen from my mother and my grandmother for all my life. And a little bit of wine. Little things like that, little touches. In other words, you didn't have to be an Italian American to, to, to get off on that. A little bit of sugar, and that's my trick. One of the scenes that I remember is when De Niro comes home and he gets the apple for his wife with a piece of fruit. It's a pear. And the gift of this piece of fresh fruit for his wife is like, you know, that's like the, the blue bag of a Tiffany. Hey, better she just lights up. And that scene seems like a memory. De Niro is your grandfather. You want to think your grandfather bought your grandmother a piece of fruit. And in that sequence where you see Pacino put on the mantle of the family. I mean, again, it's a memory. They don't say if he's dead or alive. My father was a very powerful man physically. My father was a very powerful man physically. And when my father was dying of cancer, that was the horror of it, was you go, that's not my dad. This man who's so feeble and so weak and so uh, um, enervated. Yeah, 
Long Beach four, five, six, And from the moment he comes in, he becomes who he becomes. Nurse, wait a minute. Stay here. He realizes this is my destiny. You shot my father. You mom, I'm gonna kill every motherfucking one of you fucking people. You know, if, if, it, if it means my own life, if it means my own life, you know? And all these passions that we're talking about, this is what the movie stirs up in you. This is a film that improves every time you see it. I thought it was terrific when I first saw it, you know, but I just, every time I saw it again and again, I liked it more and more. There's a real richness, there's a real texture. It's like a great novel that you can reread and you find other things and you've forgotten something and you notice things because you're at a different age in your life and different characters' dilemmas mean something different to you. What was a huge change for me seeing The Godfather was the humanity and emotion. I, I wish you would have let me know you were coming. I, I could have prepared something for you. The most emotionally charged scenes in the movie obviously belong to the gangsters. And they have the same emotions that you and I would have. Scenes like after they've fired into his house and he says, In my home! And there's this level of rage that is building inside of him. In my bedroom where my wife sleeps. There are these kind of psychotic break moments. Where my children come and play with their toys. Where you have the neurotic gangster, which I think totally leads to Tony Soprano. Godfather really kind of set the tone for taking that kind of movie out of the old, you, know, you know the old days of, you know, the old Paul Muni movies of uh, and Edward G. Robinson movies and took it into a whole other kind of level of reality. This is Alec Capone. We just talked over your new brewery down at the stockyards. What is this? Take a look and see what we got for you, Snorky. What are you talking about? You talk a straighter all the jamming this and falling down your throat. Well, I remember how Italians were depicted on television, and even uh, Chico Marx, uh, who, who played an Italian who talked like this. And, uh, you know, I was Italian, and my relatives didn't talk like this. Look at me. A man always got to know what he's got to know. I got a plenty, I got a house, I got an automobile, I got a nicer girl. <laughs> One thing about those early 30s movies was you always had to have a moral ending. So it was like if you had a guy who committed all these crimes, and what ends up happening? He gets shot up by like 18 million machine gun hits. I mean, I guess the message of the movie was supposed to be is crime doesn't pay, but that's, <laughs> you know, it had all these uh, disclaimers and advisories about the blight of gangsters and uh, organized crime. Now they had a distinctly American a moralistic point of view about making them colorful, yes, attractive, yes, but reproachable and uh, punishable. Come on, get your hands behind your head. The Godfather allowed for these things to be discussed in human terms and not moral terms only, or at least the moral palette became more ambiguous. The story of the undertaker who had his daughter abused and beaten, that the court system and the police Nobody would do anything, and that you had to go to some honorable person like Don Corleone to get justice. Take a hold of him. Morally and ethically, it showed a world that was corrupted from the top down. My father's no different than any other powerful man. Any man who's responsible for other people, like a senator or a president. You know how naive you sound. Why? Senators and presidents don't have men killed. Oh. Who's being naive, Kay? The elements that are put together are not calibrated the normal way. You know, where, where you see a side that is not corrupted and a side that is corrupted and how ultimately the good guys win. Senator, we're both part of the same hypocrisy. I mean, it, when, since I've been a little kid, I've never trusted adults. I've never trusted authority. And this movie um, just fortifies that in, in a very grand operatic way that 
you know, everywhere you look, there is corruption or corruptibility or the potential for it. These people are working a system and they're playing within a system which everybody is corrupt. So let's just say that you'll pay me because it's in your interest to pay me. But I want your answer in the money by noon tomorrow. When you think about it, it's a deeply cynical uh, outlook on life. You know, that they love their families, they're loyal to them. But, but in the end, what it is, it's about power. You can have my answer now if you like. My offer is this. Nothing. Not even the fee for the gaming license, which I would appreciate if you would put up personally. The metaphor was, you know, we, we're just like the government, or we're just like these kings, and basically, you know, we do things the same way they do it, but we do it our way. I think people bought that hook, line, and sinker, you know, because they gave you enough of that other stuff to be, like, horrified, and then at the other time, they did it, and it was so, you know, delicate. Leave the gun. Take the cannoli. And it was, I would say, probably a romanticized version of that world. But that's what great art does. It condenses something and elevates it. Not everything is the truth. There's, a, there's another truth that it can achieve. Francis, he's totally an individual and totally an original. We had many disagreements. It was the disagreements that make things work. In a sense, every film is a series of hugely improbable events that only look logical after the fact. When you see how it all comes together, you say, well, of course, it had to be that way. He always has bad feelings about the movie, and it's mostly the experience. It's not the movie itself. I used to say a big part of that movie was Coppola standing up for what he wanted and staying, you know, holding his ground, and then I realized, no, that's not part of it. That's it. He knocked down the wall, you know, uh, that the establishment had put up against people like Francis and Scorsese and, and people like Friedkin and Bogdanovich. People were willing to take more of a chance on young talent and to see innovation as maybe the key to financial success rather than to financial oblivion. It's a good reminder of what a delicate thing it is to create a really fine work of art in any discipline and how dangerous it is to interfere with that. Thank you.